Welcome to lesson five. In this lesson, we're going to look at light and at matter. And if you look at the sky at night and you see the stars, um, the information that we can gather from those stars arrives to us in the form of light. So the interaction of light and matter can tell us what the stars are made of and much more. So we want to spend this lesson learning about the interaction between light and matter. And then in the rest of the class, we will apply this information on understanding how the stars work, where they come from, and what will happen to them when they're done burning. So if you have any questions, be sure to let me know and enjoy the lesson. In this lesson, um, we're going to study radiation. Um, radiation is um, the energy that's carried by light, and we're going to learn how to use that radiation to understand the stars when we look through a telescope. So in this first part of the lecture, um, we're going to concentrate on light. So we know light carries energy. If you've ever stood out in the sun on a nice summer day, um, you felt that energy on your face. And we use the units of joules um, when we talk about energy. So energy is measured in units of joules. But more interested, what we're usually more interested in is the flow of energy or how much energy is used per amount of time. Um, and the unit for that is the watt. So um, watt is one joule per second. And so you've probably run into this unit before when you buy light bulbs. A 100 watt light bulb will use 100 joules of energy every second it's on. So Isaac Newton um, studied light, and he found that white light was made up of all the different colors. And he did this by shining white light on a prism. But many people thought that the colors were part of the prism. So what he did then is he took a second prism, and he put it just in the red part of the spectrum. And only red came out of that prism, showing that light itself is made up of many different colors. So light interacts with matter, and it can do this in several ways. Uh, matter can emit light, so there's emission. Uh, matter can absorb light, so there's absorption. Um, light can pass through matter, and it can transmit light through it. So we have transmission, and you're familiar with this with your glasses. Um, light will transmit through your glasses, but if you have a wall, light will not transmit through the wall, so the wall would be opaque. If you have sunglasses, they don't transmit as much light as your regular glasses, but they still transmit some of the light. There's also reflection. Um, if you look in a mirror, um, you can see light reflecting from the mirror. And there's also scattering. So if you shine light on a wall, that light will scatter. This magnifying glass is making my eye look big. Now, why is that? I don't know. Please consider the following. Okay. When light enters something like air, water, glass, or plastic, it slows down a little. And when it slows down, it changes direction. See how one eye is lower than the other? See? Take a look at this. Here are three straight beams of light. When they go into the piece of plastic straight, they come out straight. But if the plastic is tilted, the beams of light get tilted. See, they change direction, so they come out this side offset. Now, what would happen if the piece of plastic didn't have straight sides, but had a curved side, like a magnifying glass? Well, the light would change direction, right? Because the surface of the plastic is curved, each beam of light enters the piece of plastic at a slightly different angle, and it changes direction a slightly different amount. Oh, look, over here, the beams of light come together at a single point. This is called the focal point. Now, what about the magnifying glass? Well, suppose your eye were over here, and light from the room were bouncing off of your eye and going through the piece of plastic this way. Well then, the small area at this end would be spread out over a large area on this side. Your eye would be magnified. Ha! Thanks for joining me on Consider the Following. Bill, Bill, Bill Nye, the science guy. 
So as Bill Nye showed us, light can also refract and reflect. And there's two different types of reflection. There's specular reflection. And uh, an example would be a mirror or calm water. And we know in this case that the angle of incidence is always equal to the angle of reflection. So if I have light coming along here and shining on a mirror, the angle it hits the mirror at is going to be equal to the angle it reflects at. There's also diffuse reflection. Um, this would be reflection from an object, say a white wall or a ceiling, and the light gets scattered in lots of random different directions. So there's lots of examples of diffuse reflection. Also, we know that matter will absorb some colors, so different materials interact differently with light. So if you look at white light shining, say, on a green lawn, then the lawn is absorbing all of the colors except for the green, which is why the line appears green. So if you want to think about this, if I shine white light on an apple, why does the apple appear red? Well, I'm sure you got that. The apple absorbs all of the colors except for the red, and it reflects the red light. So that's a key thing to remember, is that different materials interact with light in different ways. So we can ask the question, what is light? And this is one of the oldest um, problems in physics. And Isaac Newton thought light was a collection of corpuscles, or small particles. And they found shortly after that light also behaves like a wave. And it's been a debate in physics until recently. What is light? Is it a wave or a particle? And what we know now is sometimes light will behave like a wave, and sometimes it will behave like a particle. And we call that the wave-particle duality. So what are some of the wave-like properties of light? Well, waves can carry momentum. Um, if you've ever gone to the ocean and stood in front of an incoming wave, you know that waves can carry momentum because it will push you back. And waves don't necessarily have to transport any material. If you drop a pebble in a pond, you can see the ripples moving across the pond, but the water just oscillates up and down. It does not move with the ripples. So what are some of the characteristics of waves that we're interested in? Well, waves have different things or different properties that we use when we discuss waves. And if I look at the distance between two peaks or two troughs, I call that distance the wavelength. If I count how many times something vibrates per second, I will call that the frequency. And the height of the vibration we call the amplitude. So here, um, wave speed, um, a property of all harmonic waves is wave speed is equal to wavelength times the frequency. So if I look at the wavelength and multiply that by how many times it oscillates up and down in a second, that tells me the speed that the wave is traveling at. And when I look at light, you may have heard that light is an electromagnetic wave. Well, what do we mean by that? What's actually oscillating um, when light passes by? Um, we understand things in physics in terms of fields. So the Earth produces a gravitational field, and the moon is attracted to the Earth due to its interaction with that field. The electric and magnetic forces work in much the same way. So as light travels through space, it's an oscillation in these fields, in the electric ma and magnetic fields. And then these electric and magnetic fields can then interact with matter. Um, the speed of light is a constant. It always travels at 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, or very close to that. And that's at the speed of light in a vacuum. It can slow down when it travels through a material, but the speed is always a constant in the vacuum. And that speed is the wavelength times the frequency. So that means if I increase the wavelength, I have to decrease the frequency to keep that constant. If I decrease the wavelength, I have to increase the frequency in order to keep the speed of light a constant. So light can also act like a particle. And these particles of light we call photons. And each photon has its own wavelength and its own frequency. So they still exhibit wave-like properties. And we can talk about the frequency of a single photon. If I take the wavelength and the frequency and multiply them together, I get the speed of light. And if I take Planck's constant, h, times the frequency, that tells me how much energy is in each photon. Now, there's lots more light than what we can see. Um, what we see is actually a very small part of the light spectrum. Um, it's the visible spectrum. Um, I can go to much, much higher frequencies, much, much, 
more energetic, and these would be photons coming from the nuclei. I can also get much less energetic. I can get infrared and microwave and radio waves of much longer wavelength. So light comes in a very broad spectrum, and we can only see with our eyes a very small bit of that light. So in the next part of the lecture, we will talk about matter. So stay tuned for part two. In this part of the lesson, we're going to discuss matter and talk a little bit about how light interacts with matter. And going back to the Greeks, um, they believed that all things were made up of just a few items, indivisible small items. And in the 19th century, um, we found evidence of this, and we called these in their atoms um, from the atomos. And atom means indivisible. And we now know that the atom is made up of even smaller pieces. But atoms consist of a nucleus, and around that nucleus is a cloud of electrons. And the nucleus has neutrons and protons in it. Um, the protons have a positive electrical charge, and the neutrons have no charge. So the element um, that we talk about um, is determined by how many protons are in an atom. For instance, hydrogen will have one proton, helium will have two protons, and so forth. Um, I can have different numbers of neutrons inside the nucleus. For instance, helium can have two neutrons, and that will give it four nucleons, two protons plus two neutrons, and that is the atomic mass number n. Now it's possible for helium to only have one neutron, and in that case its atomic mass number would be three. It still has two protons, so it's still considered helium. It is called an isotope of helium. You may be familiar with these with carbon. Um, carbon that we're most familiar with is carbon-12. It has six protons and six neutrons. But you may hear uh, heard of carbon-14 um, for carbon dating, which would have two extra neutrons in the nucleus. So matter can exist in different stages, depending on how tightly bound the atoms in a molecule are. And it can exist as a solid, where the atoms are very tightly bound, and it is very rigid. It consists of a liquid, where they are less bound, a gas, and if I add enough energy or enough heat, I can liberate all the electrons from the protons or from the nucleus, and that would be a, a gas of just free nuclei and electrons, which we would call a plasma. So we can change from one phase to another. Um, you're familiar with this with water. You can change it from ice into liquid into steam. So melting is the breaking of very rigid chemical bonds. Um, evaporation is the breaking of flexible chemical bonds from a liquid to a gas. Dissociation is a breaking of molecular bonds. So that would be separating the hydrogen and oxygen in water. And ionization strips the electrons off of those atoms and forms a plasma. So atoms can store energy. Um, they, within the atom, there are very discrete energy levels. And the energy levels are determined and very specific for each atom. So they will act as a fingerprint. So the available energy levels in an atom um, acts like a fingerprint for that atom. And electrons are able to move from one energy level to another. But they have to absorb or emit exactly the amount of energy that is the difference between these energy levels. And the theory that we use to understand this is called quantum mechanics. And it was a effort of many people over many years. Um.